Welcome once again to the beautiful outdoors. And again, for the second week in a row, I brought my beautiful wife out here to uh, share a special message with us, a message of encouragement, just like we shared last week. And uh, so I'm really looking forward to it. But before she shares, I'd like to offer a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for your many blessings towards us. Thank you for the beauties of your creation. Thank you for your word that brings us encouragement, even in difficult times. Lord, I pray that you will bless each one who is listening today. Be with Christina as she shares a message of encouragement for us. And Lord, as we go through this place, may the beauty and peace of your nature fill our hearts with your love. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Christina, I can't hear, wait to hear what you have in store for us. Well, let's go for a walk in the woods. All right, let's go. Have you ever looked around and wondered what you had to offer the world? Like maybe your talents are so small or you can't do much. Maybe you don't have much money to give to the cause. Maybe you're just, just not feeling inspired to do something. Whatever it is, you aren't alone. I'd like you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of 2 Kings. And we're going to look at a fascinating story in 2 Kings chapter 4 about a woman who didn't have much, but God gave her more. beautiful out here. The birds are singing. You can hear the creek flowing by. The woods are so majestic. The sun is just slipping over the horizon. What a beautiful time to be outdoors in God's creation. I'm so thankful for his creation. When Elijah went to heaven, Elisha, the prophet, was prophet in his stead, took over Elijah's place in the land of Israel. Elisha was uh, a first, just a personal servant of Elijah. Started out very small. Uh, he was known as the, the young man who poured water over the hands of Elijah. But after Elijah went to heaven, Elisha took his place with power. He did an amazing work, reformation in Israel with the schools of the prophets. And in one town where he was working, there was a school of the prophets nearby. The school of the prophets, I should explain, was not a school for prophets. It was a school taught by the prophets. And uh, it was a school where uh, the young men could come and they would learn a trade. Uh, they would learn about the Bible. They would memorize the scriptures. They would learn music. And uh, it, the School of the Prophets was one of the biggest things to work a revival in the land of Israel. That same revival that Elijah had envisioned clear back there on Mount Carmel was wrought by his successor in the Schools of the Prophets. 
But uh, our story in 2 Kings chapter 4 is about a young woman. Her husband was a student in the schools of the prophets. And uh, the family was a devout family of God. Uh, she had two young boys. And her son got, excuse me, her son, her husband got sick and died. And she was left a widow in a house that they owed money on, and she couldn't pay the bills. Her sons were too young to go and work and earn a living to provide for her needs. And the next thing she knew, her creditor, who she owed money to on the house, was knocking at the door asking for payment. And not only was he asking for payment, but he said, if you can't pay me, then I'm going to take your two sons as my slaves. Oh, what a terrible position to be in as a widow. What could she do? Where could she go? Who could she turn to? And then she thought, I know where to go. I'm going to go to the prophet himself, Elisha. So this widow, in her last extremity, with nothing else to do, nowhere else to go, and no one to turn to, comes to Elisha. And we read her words in 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse 1. It says, A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? And she said, Your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Only a jar of oil. It may not have looked this pretty either. And it may have been a lot smaller than this. We don't know how big that jar of oil was. That's all she had in her house. No furniture, no food to eat, nothing in her house except a jar of oil. What could she do with a jar of oil? Is that, that's it. Like, and especially with it being so small, it might bring in a few pennies, but nothing to solve uh, her major debt with this creditor. But this woman had faith that God was going to do something. And so she listened carefully to Elisha's words. He said to her, Go and borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons and pour it into all these vessels and set aside the full ones. Well, that was a strange thing. Go and borrow a bunch of empty jars? And not just a few, he said. A whole house full of them. Borrow all the jars you can possibly get from your neighbors. But you know what? She didn't even ask why. She turned around and immediately went home. And she sent her sons. And they went and they gathered all kinds of jars. I can imagine. Oh, my hands are full. Maybe I'll uh, get rid of my Bible here. But uh, I can just imagine, you know, these great big jars and these little bitty ones and the medium sized ones and the water pots and everything that she could possibly borrow from her neighbors. I, I can just see her son knocking on the door. Uh, excuse me. Uh, do you have any empty jars I can borrow? Uh, <laughs> And probably the whole neighborhood wondered, what on earth does she want these jars for? But nobody asked. Nobody said anything. And when she had all the jars, I can just see her house just lined up with jars all the way across the floor. Jars everywhere. She closed the door. And I can just see her kneeling on the floor with her two sons and her little bitty jar of oil and saying, God, this is all I have. I'm asking you to use it. And then she began to pour. And as she poured, 
the oil kept coming. So she continued to pour, filling jar after jar after jar after jar. She kept pouring and the oil kept coming out. And she began to look and the room started filling not with empty jars, but with full jars of oil. And she continued pouring and she kept asking her sons to bring her another jar and she'd fill it up and bring her another jar and she'd fill it up. And finally she had filled up every jar across her floor and there was still oil in there. And she asked her sons, can you go and borrow another jar? And they said, no, mom, we have borrowed every single jar in the neighborhood. There's not another jar left. I can see him running back to the neighbors again, just to check. Do you have one more jar that we could borrow? And when they'd used up every last one, the oil ran out and she didn't have any more oil left. And here she is surrounded by jars full of oil. She was so excited. She didn't even think about what to do next. She simply just ran out of her house and ran straight back to the prophet Elisha and said, Elisha, you won't believe what just happened. All of the jars, like my whole floor is covered with jars and they're all full of oil. But what do I do with all this oil? Like, I, I mean, I've never seen so much oil in all my life. And Elisha just smiled and he said, go take those jars to the market and sell the oil. Give the neighbors back their jars and pay off all your debts. What a beautiful story. You know, every time I think of this story, this poor woman had so much against her. For one, she was a woman. In that society, she couldn't own anything. She couldn't work. She couldn't go and just get a job. Uh, her job was to support her husband. And without a husband, she had nothing. When she went to Elisha asking for help, Elisha didn't have to help her. According to the customs of the day, he could have said, well, you've got your two sons. Let them work off the debt. That's the best thing you can do. But he didn't. Because you know what? God cares for women. God cares for men too. And God cares for children. God cares for everyone. He doesn't leave anyone out. He doesn't promote somebody else above somebody else. He provides for everyone's needs. And Elisha did not turn this woman away. And this woman did. She went and she and her sons took all of those jars of oil. They went to the market, they sold them all. And with the money, she was able to pay off all her debts and have money to live on besides. Isn't God amazing? This poor widow that we've just been talking about with her two sons was not the only woman that Elisha helped. If we go on to the next verse, in verse 8, we find another woman. And this one was not a poor woman. This one was a notable woman. But she was still a woman. And as a woman, she couldn't do much. But she did what she could. This woman noticed that Elisha would come through her town and she would invite him to come and eat. She knew that he was tired and hot and hungry after his long journeys and she just loved to be able to feed him, give him a place to rest and get him on his way. Now she noticed that he came through her town often. So one day she came to her husband and said, honey, I think I have the greatest idea. Why don't we build a little tiny addition onto our house and make a little room? And I love what she says. She says, let's make a small upper room. This is verse 10. Small upper room on the wall. Let us put a bed for him and a table and a chair 
and a lampstand. So it will be whenever he comes to us, he can spend the night. I love, I love her womanly touch as she builds this little room, you know, with the, the bed, the table, the chair, the lampstand. She thought of everything to make him perfectly comfortable in this little upper room. And so the next time Elisha came through, he stopped by for a meal. She surprised him and said, Elisha, you don't have to go and sleep out in the woods tonight. You can sleep in our house. We have a room for you. And we're just going to call it Elisha's room. And anytime you come through, you can come and spend the night. And so Elisha did. And he was so grateful to have this welcome retreat where he could stay on his travels. So one day he said, I want to do something for you. Is there anything I can do for you as a thank you gift for this hospitality that you have been showing to me? And so he asked around and discovered that she didn't have a son. She had no heir, no one to take care of her in her old age. That was a tragedy back in an Israelite household, not to have a child, especially not to have a son. That was your social security. That was your insurance. That was your, your nursing home. I mean, that was everything that you needed when you got old. Not to mention having someone to take over your house and your property and your farm after you passed away. So, Elisha comes to her and he said, in verse 16, he says, about this time next year, you will have a son. She was shocked. She had no idea what he had been thinking about. And she, she immediately says, no, please, please don't get my hopes up. Please don't lie to me. This couldn't be possible. But yet it was possible. And a year later, she had a beautiful baby boy. She was so excited, so grateful for this bundle of joy. And the little boy grew up. So this woman's little boy grew up and one day he was out in the fields with his father working in the fields and suddenly he started crying, my head, my head. And so they took him back to the house and he saw it on his mother's lap and died. She was in shock. This beloved son that was promised her by the prophet Elisha that she had prayed so long for. And now he was dead, suddenly taken away from her in shock. She went running out to her husband and said, can I please have a donkey so that I can go to the prophet Elijah? And he said, why do you want to go to the prophet Elijah? She didn't even tell him that their son was dead. She just simply laid her son on the bed in that upper room that she had built for that prophet, got on the donkey, and went straight to Elisha. Elisha didn't know what was going on. God didn't reveal to him that she was coming. And when he saw her, he had no idea why she would be even coming to him. When she got to him, Elisha's servant tried to stop her, tried to put her away from him because she went all the way up to Elisha and fell down at his feet and, uh, He's just like, a, we, we need to take care of this woman. She shouldn't be this close to you. But Elisha, with the amazing ability and insight that he had from God, he said to her, actually he said to his servant, he said, let her alone. For her soul is in deep distress and the Lord has hid it from me and has not told me. You can just hear the care and concern for this woman in his voice. Let her alone. It's okay. She's in distress. She'll tell us what's going on. 
and the words out of her mouth were, Did I not ask a son of you? Didn't I tell you, don't deceive me? And Elisha knew immediately what had happened. Her son was gone. So quickly he sent his servant ahead of him and said, Lay my staff on him. His servant did and came back and said, There's nothing. No movement, no sound, no nothing. So Elisha went to that room and laid on that boy and prayed. And I can just imagine his prayer. Here it was, the son that he had prayed for to bless this woman in her old age. And now her son was dead. He didn't understand, but he prayed. And in answer to his prayer, God resurrected that boy from the dead and he brought her back to that woman again. What a story. What a story of a woman who just did what she could with what she had in her house. I don't know about you, but I see a theme in these two stories with these two women. Of course, they were both women. And of course, in both instances, God had pity on them and took care of them in their needs. But I think there's a lot more to this story. And it goes back to those words that Elisha asked that widow when he said, what do you have in your house? What is in your house? You know, for me, so many times I think, I'm just a woman. I, I'm not of any power. I don't have lots of money. I don't have lots of things I can do. What, what can I do for God? And I believe God is asking that question to us. What is in your house? What do you have? What talents have I given you that you can use for me, even if it's small? The widow had nothing, nothing in her whole house but that little pot of oil. And God used it. God used it to work a miracle, to save her from financial ruin and to keep her alive and her sons. The woman, that uh, the notable woman, the Shunammite that uh, we talked about, who built that little house for the little room for Elisha, she didn't have much either. She was just a woman. She couldn't do much, but she could say, husband, let's build a little room. Let's, let's make a little room on our house, a little spot for God's prophet. So I can show a little more hospitality and alleviate his distress when he's traveling. Just a little thing. It was what she had in her house. It was the little that she could do. And once again, God used it not only to bless others and bless Elisha, but to bless her as well. So once again, I ask you, what is in your house? What little has God given you that you can use for him? You know, the Bible tells us, the liberal soul shall be made fat and he that waters shall be watered also himself. When we use that little bit, that was from Proverbs 11, when we use that little bit that God gives us, whether it be a little talent, whether it be a little offering, you think of the widow's two mites in the story of Jesus, whether it be a little bit of food, like the little boy that had a little lunch that fed 5,000 people. God can take that little bit, whatever you have, and multiply it. Maybe it's just one small talent. Maybe the only thing you can do is you can smile at somebody. Or maybe you have the gift of cheering somebody up. Maybe the gift of hospitality. Maybe, the, the, maybe you're not a preacher, not a teacher. You can't do much for God. But you can share the love of Jesus by a kind act of kindness, acts of service. Whatever little that God has given you, ask God to him to reveal it to you, because I know he will. In fact, I want to just ask God right now, if that's okay. Father, we don't have much. We're just poor, sinful human beings. We make mistakes but you have so much. 
You own everything. And you've only asked for just a little bit from us. Lord, we don't know what's in our house right now. But I'm asking you right now for each of us who are here together at this moment that you will reveal what that little bit is in our house, what little we can do for you. And Father, we know that when we use it, you will multiply it. You will multiply it just like that woman with the oil. You will multiply in ways that can bless others around us and bring blessings on us as well. Father, we claim the promises that you have given to us. We ask for this now. We ask that you will use us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.